All right, guys, so we're picking back up on PEA, where we left off. We've already talked about your history, signs, and symptoms, and we were right on differential. Differential, yeah. So um, your differential is referring to your differential diagnoses, meaning what are the things that could cause this condition? So there's obviously an unlimited number of things that could cause someone to die, right? But we have a list of reversible causes, and these reversible causes, these potentially reversible causes, are referred to as the H's and T's. So let's scroll down just a little bit, because everything from this point up in your protocol is the same as your general cardiac arrest protocol, EC3, that we looked at a few minutes ago. So it wants to make sure that we don't meet any criteria for death, that we're doing good quality chest compressions, and that we are utilizing defibrillation in if applicable. The very next thing on the protocol is not airway, it's not medications, it's not any of the above. Instead, it is search for reversible causes. So what are those potentially reversible causes? We call these the H's and T's. We talked about these briefly last week with your bradycardia lecture. They are hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion, hypothermia, hypo, hyperkalemia. And for the T's, tension pneumothorax, tampon, uh, excuse me, cardiac tamponade, toxins, pulmonary or cardiac thrombosis. So let's review each of these. Because some of these I can do something about, some of these I cannot do something about. So hypovolemia. Hypovolemia is low volume, which means it's either due to blood loss or it's due to just volume loss. Remember, there's a difference in hemorrhagic hypovolemia and non-hemorrhagic hypovolemia. If it's blood loss, it's hemorrhagic hypovolemia. If it's not blood loss, say it's nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or significant burns, and we're looking at two or three days later, we've got this big fluid shift. Whatever the case may be, that is a loss of volume without blood bleeding, per se. So what can we do to treat hypovolemia? We can hang a bag of fluids. It doesn't really matter. Normal saline, lactated ringers, either one is okay. We're going to hang a bag of fluid. Every single cardiac arrest patient that you come to, that you take care of, hang at least one liter bag of fluid. Run that bad boy wide open, unless the cause of the arrest was pulmonary edema maybe. But in most situations, we're going to just run that fluid wide open because we are looking to treat a reversible cause. Okay? It's like every other condition, though this in particular instance, the reversible causes are the most important thing that you can possibly treat. Okay, We have to perfuse the brain with CPR. We have to provide oxygen to the body via ventilations, but we have to try to figure out why they coded so that we can fix that so that their heart can hopefully start back on its own beating normally again. So hypovolemia, start an IV, give some fluids. Hypoxia, I should already be fixing that with my CPR because I'm ventilating the patient. Hydrogen ion, acidosis. We used to treat acidosis much earlier in cardiac arrest than we do now. We will look at how to treat acidosis in a little while, um, but generally speaking, we don't treat acidosis as a first line intervention in cardiac arrest. The only exception to that would be if I had a reason to suspect that the patient was extraordinarily acidotic before they coded and that that may be why they coded. All right, so hypothermia. Hypothermia doesn't mean that I go to them and they're cold in a warm environment per se. This would be environmental hypothermia. Um, so the patient who decided that they were big and bad and tough and went camping when it was 20 degrees and didn't take a sleeping bag, right? So this is this kind of patient we're talking about. You're not warm until you're warm and dead. Excuse me, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. I'll get it right in a minute. Hypohyperkalemia, low or high potassium levels. So there are some things that we can do to treat high potassium levels. There's not really much we can do in the pre-hospital setting to treat low potassium levels. What kind of patient, again, would be at a higher risk for having hyperkalemia? The dialysis patient. We'll talk about how to treat hyperkalemia. To your T's, tension pneumothorax. I can fix that to an extent. I can treat it at least. And you'll see that's actually the very next thing on the... Uh, protocol here. It says consider chest needle decompression procedure. We haven't actually talked about decompression yet. That was supposed to be in a couple of weeks in your airway class, so we will still be going through that in your EMS 131. But just know for right now that is an intervention that you can consider in the management of cardiac arrest um, if you highly suspect that there is a tamponade, excuse me, a um, pneumothorax or hemothorax is what I was trying to say associated with this arrest. Cardiac tamponade, there's nothing that I can do about that. Pulmonary thrombosis, IEPE, there's nothing that I can do about that. All right, so let's get back to our protocol. Remember, these reversible causes, your H's and T's are the most important thing, but that doesn't mean that that's all we're going to focus on because we have to multitask a little bit. <clears throat> 
So we've gotten the patient on the cardiac monitor. That's how we have already identified that the patient is in the PEA or asystole rhythm. That's why we arrived at this protocol. Um, so we have now established an IV or an IO. Now, as a general statement, every single person that experiences cardiac arrest, no matter what the presenting rhythm is, so no matter if it's asystole, PEA, VTAC, or VFib, no matter what the rhythm is, if they do not have a pulse, they get one milligram of epinephrine IV in a 1 to 10,000 concentration every 3 to 5 minutes, period. There's no max dose. You repeat this until you run out of epi, which is going to be a lot of epi, right? So it's 1 to 10,000 concentration. That's important. In Onslow County, we don't have 1 to 10,000 premixed right now. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but it's been something we've had a hard time getting for, I don't know, years now. Um, so we have to mix our own. But most systems carry pre-mixed epinephrine 1 to 10,000 concentration. It comes in a pre-filled syringe in a little brownish looking box. If you're not sure how to make 1 to 10,000 out of your 1 to 1,000, it's really simple. Take your ampule um, of epi 1 to 1, which is what you're going to give for an allergic reaction, that little glass ampule, break off the lid with a filtered needle, take a uh, 10 cc saline flush, push out 1 ml, so now I have 9 mls of saline in a saline flush, attach your filtered needle to it, and then draw out your 1 ml of epi 1 to 1, so that's 1 milligram and 1 milliliter. I draw that now, and I put it in essentially 10 mls, because I had 9, I added the 1, so now I have 1 milligram of epinephrine in 10 milliliters. That is a 1 to 10 concentration. That is the concentration that I need to give intravenously. I'm going to do this every 3 to 5 minutes. Important. 3 to 5 minutes, okay? I'll come back to that in just a minute, because I'm going to give you an easier way to remember this. Normal saline, we've already talked about. It says start with 500. That's cool. May repeat as needed up to two. If you hang a liter bag and run it wide open, you're going to be all right. Okay? You can go up to two liters. And again, we're trying to treat a reversible cause of cardiac arrest. All right. We're going to scroll down. Then it says available for agency medication. So the only other medication that's normally considered in the treatment of PEA slash asystole would maybe be... Now it's leaving my mind. I'm sorry. Goodness gracious. It's ADH. It's antidiuretic hormone, but I can't think of the name of it. Vasopressin. There we go. Vasopressin. Not vasopressor, but vasopressin. And vasopressin can be given in place of the first or the second dose of epinephrine. It's not commonly used anymore. It got popular several years ago, but there's a lot of evidence to kind of discredit its use. On that note, there's also very little evidence to support the use of epinephrine. Epinephrine is in class 2 for the AHA um, recommendations, meaning that there is not substantial evidence to support its use, but there's also no real evidence to show that it is harmful. So basically what it means is it may do some good and it's not hurting people, so let's continue doing it. Um, so it's interesting how the staple of your management, there's really no evidence to support it. But that's a story for a different day. You'll hear that soapbox before we finish the program, I promise. So epi is the only drug that we give in every single uh, situation in cardiac arrest. For asystole and PEA, it is literally the only drug I'm going to give as a general cardiac arrest management medication. That does not mean, though, that I may not give some other drugs for the management of one of these potential reversible causes. We will continue to break these down later. That is not for today. And the pearls for this are exactly the same as the pearls in the other protocol we were looking at just a moment ago. So we're not going to go through that. All right, let's go to our other protocol, which is VTAC VFib. So we're either in PEA or we're in VTAC VFib. And I see either in PEA. We're in PEA or asystole, which is one protocol, and then VTAC or VFib, which is the other protocol. All right, the only two ways, again, that you can go about treating cardiac arrest, only two potential algorithms. All right. So everything again from here up is exactly the same. We're still going to search for reversible causes. That's first, right after CPR and AED usage. That must mean it's important, okay? Again, H's and T's are exactly the same as they were in your other protocol. Make sure you think about this. IV, what do we give for everybody in cardiac arrest? Oh yeah, we give epi 1 to 10,000, 1 milligram every 3 to 5 minutes. Now, there are kind of two time frames that you've got to keep up with when you are treating cardiac arrest, especially if the patient is in a ventricular rhythm because we are going to defibrillate this patient if they're in a ventricular rhythm, right? Because VTAC and VFib are both shockable rhythms. So let's, did I mess it up here? 
here we go. I actually scrolled past it. I apologize. So go back up here to the top for a minute. We have CPR and AED slash I'm going to be the AED because I'm now a paramedic and I'm going to interpret this patient's rhythm. So every two minutes, like this in your brain, every two minutes, I'm going to stop chest compressions for no more than 10 seconds and I'm going to assess the rhythm and I'm going to assess the patient's pulse. So I'm going to look at the monitor, I'm going to print the, uh, the screen, print the rhythm, and see what the rhythm is. Don't ever just go by what you see on the monitor itself, excuse me, because oftentimes it looks different on the monitor than it does when you print it. I always print it. And I'm going to feel a carotid pulse. Okay, so the reason for that is, let's say I look down and I see VTAC on the monitor, but I don't check a pulse, and I say, well, the patient hasn't had a pulse, so that's VTAC without a pulse, so we're going to defibrillate this patient asynchronous at 200 joules. If they weren't dead already, now they are. Congratulations. So you have to check a pulse every two minutes. Every two minutes, check a pulse, check a rhythm. Okay, pulse check, rhythm check is what we say. Make sure that this pulse check, rhythm check, though, does not take more than 10 seconds. Maximum 10 seconds of hands off the chest. Okay? Now, if it is a shock or rhythm, meaning if there is no pulse and it is either pulses VTAC or it is VFib, then we're going to defibrillate the patient. So let me give you a key point here. And I wish that I had cardiac monitor and a mannequin and all this stuff that's sitting in front of me to, to really show you what I'm talking about. They have completely locked us out of the classroom now and they've actually locked us out of our office. So I have no access to anything on campus whatsoever. I'm going to have to drive up to the campus and sit in the parking lot just to upload these videos in order to do the class. But that's okay. I don't mind doing that. But when you are coming up on your two minute mark so i arrived on scene i've been working this code and we're approaching our two minute mark even if the patient was not in a ventricular rhythm the last rhythm check go ahead and charge your monitor to however much energy you're going to get for a defibrillation meaning it's either 150 joules excuse me either 200 joules or manufacturer's recommendations i misspoke it's either 200 joules or manufacturer's recommendation. Our current monitors are 150 joules, manufacturer's recommendations. So I'm coming up to the, the rhythm check. Um, my, my partner's doing chest compressions, 27, 28, 29, 30 chest compressions. We're going to stop, pulse check, look at the monitor, rhythm check, see is it ventricular, is it not ventricular. When we come up to that, when I'm finishing that last round of CPR, charge your monitor. And the reason for that is if you don't charge your monitor and have it roaring and ready to go, because it's not going to shock until you hit the shock button, right? If you don't have that monitor pre-charged, then we're going to stop chest compressions. All right, I'm checking a pulse. I, I don't think I feel it. Well, maybe, no, yeah, uh, no I, I'm pretty sure I don't feel anything. What's the rhythm? Okay, well, the rhythm is V-fib. Well, my 10 seconds are already over, right? So I've got to get back on the chest now. The difference would be, and, and let me back up. So I've got to get back on the chest, and then I'm going to have to stop chest compressions again to defibrillate, right? Because I'm not keeping my hands on the chest while you press that shock button. Um, so we're actually stopping compressions twice. And remember, the two most important things we can do are CPR and defibrillation. So we want hands on the chest as much as possible. So in order to prevent more time off the chest, we're going to pre-charge. When we get to that two-minute mark, I'm going to be ready to shock. It is charged. All right. Right, charge 200 joules pulse check i'm not sure oh wait no no i don't feel anything what oh yeah we're still in v-fib that's shockable shocking i'm clear you're clear everybody's clear shock shock delivered right back on the chest so after we defibrillate the patient we do not check for a pulse we do not check the rhythm we get right back on the chest period end of discussion the only potential option out of that would be if your patient had some form of obvious life they're starting to move their eyes are blinking they're breathing on their own something <coughs> they have some obvious sign of life then we don't have to start back chest compressions immediately but in any other situation which is going to be almost every time as soon as that defibrillation is administered your hands are right back on the center of the chest and you are doing chest compressions okay all right so we're going to defib now every two minutes we're going to do a pulse check we're going to do a rhythm check, and we're going to defib if it is a ventricular rhythm, meaning VTAC or VFib, every two minutes. So this is where the two time frames come in. We said you have one time frame that's every three to five minutes for your uh, epinephrine, and we're going to see in just a moment that's for all of your medications or every three to five minutes. And you have another time frame that's every two minutes for pulse check, rhythm check, defibrillation. So the easiest way to do this is to give your meds every other pulse check, rhythm check. Because if I'm checking the pulse, checking the rhythm every two minutes, then two of those is going to be four minutes. That's between three and five. So if I give meds every other rhythm check, then I'm good to go. 
So pulse check, rhythm check, and defib every two minutes if it's a ventricular rhythm. Give meds every other rhythm check. That'll be right on the money at four minutes.